guys, thank you, about the importance of staying connected to your why in order to achieve excellence. Today, my focus is on patient advocacy and helping you to determine whose team are you on. Well, we all are on Team BWMC. As we work here, we uphold their policies, their values, we care about our coworkers, and we often rock their shirts and jackets. But how many of you make a point to make sure that you're on Team U? As a new nurse, I was often told that I spent way too much time in my patient's room, that I was gonna become burned out from being emotionally invested. December 23rd, 2012, I had the pleasure of caring for Chris. Chris was a 28-year-old male who had been diagnosed with stomach cancer. That night, his wife and daughter came to visit him they set up a small little Christmas tree in his room and they drew him pictures. When they left, I went in and I told Chris what a beautiful family he had. Chris instantly broke down crying. You see, Chris knew that this was the last Christmas that he would spend with his girls. They discovered his cancer too late and they had given him less than six months to live. I sat with Chris and I held him and we cried together for what seemed like a very long time. And when I let go, Chris told me story after story about how he met his wife, the vacations they'd been on, the places they still wanted to see, and how amazing his girls were. The charge nurse had peeked in on me a couple of times, and when I came out, she warned me, you will never last as a nurse if you cry with your patients. 11 years later, I still think about Chris time to time, and guess what? I'm still a nurse. <laughs> being part of Team U means being true to who you are as a person and not letting anybody change that. Newer nurses are often criticized for being overcautious and worrying too much. One night I cared for an older lady, but she was alert and oriented, sharp as a whip, very funny and she slept well through the night. That morning, I went in to administer her 6 a.m. heparin injection. And when I went in, something was wrong. She couldn't respond to me. I could tell she was trying to open her eyes, but they would just flutter and she couldn't formulate any words. The hospital that I worked at required that you let the charge nurse know before you called a rapid or a brain attack. It was a little after 6.20 a.m. and day shift comes in at seven. And I told the charge nurse, I have to call a rapid on room 17. There's something wrong with her. She can't wake up fully. She said, don't you dare call a rapid right before shift change. She's fine. She's just sleepy. I said, she's not sleepy. There's something wrong with her. She said, do not call a rapid. I called a rapid anyway. And I got no help from my charge nurse or any of the other nurses who were visibly upset with me. I pushed the patient to CT by myself. I waited with her. I brought her back. I communicated with the doctor and I helped coordinate her transfer to Hopkins because she had a brain bleed. The nurse coming on that was taking over Cheryl had over 25 years of experience. And she said in front of me and others, I guess my morning will be spent cleaning up the new nurse's mess. I cried my entire way home. But whose team was I on? I was on team me because I stood up for what I believed in and I didn't do what I knew was not right. And I was on team patient because I advocated by calling that rapid, taking her to CT and taking her, getting her transferred to Hopkins. Now I'm gonna get a little bit more personal with you. I'm gonna talk about when a loved one was a patient and I was the wife or the daughter, not the nurse. I got married June 6, 2009 to the love of my life. Nine months later, March 20th, 2010, our lives were turned upside down. You see, Mike was jumped by 10 to 12 guys who hit him over the head with full liquor bottles. His brain swelled so much that they had to remove part of his skull. I was on the fourth floor of shock trauma, surrounded by 
family members whose loved ones were in motorcycle accidents, skiing accidents, hit by a car when walking. One poor guy had a dental infection that went to his brain. And I wasn't a nurse yet. I was actually completing my prereqs at Howard Community College and was unsure if I wanted to be a dental hygienist or a nurse. The nurses at Shock Trauma helped me to see I was destined to be a nurse. Mike was 29 years old in a chemically induced coma, intubated, had a peg tube, half of his skull was missing. I was so lost, we were newlyweds. I married a man five years younger than me, and what now? Was I gonna have to push him around in a wheelchair the rest of my life, change his diaper, wipe his drool? I didn't sign up for that. And as all of these thoughts were swimming in my head, the nurses there were my saviors. They told me how brave I was, how strong I was to stay there day after day and be by his side, and that by me being there, showing that he had someone who loved him would make all the difference in his care. They encouraged me to start a journal and to write down everything that I was feeling. I brought in pictures of Mike and me, and I taped them to the glass doors. I brought in his favorite blanket, and on most days, they let me play reggae softly for a couple hours a day. As people would come in and out, they would look at the pictures, and they would ask me questions about Mike, about us, our life. It meant so much that they cared about who we were. One night, a PTT came in to give him a bath, and I asked her if she wanted me to leave the room. She smiled and said, no. I want you to help me. And I love that she wanted to involve me in the care. She helped me become less afraid to touch him, to realize I wasn't going to hurt him by touching these wires, these tubes, all these things that were so scary. And she said, I don't do this for all of my patients, but tonight we're gonna to use the smell good bath. And when we mixed the water and the soap in the basin, it really did smell good. And I swear when we bathed Mike, he smiled. I have no idea if the nurses on the fourth floor of shock trauma have any idea how much they meant to me or how inspirational they were in my journey on becoming a nurse. But I will never forget their kindness, their support, their caring touch, and their hope. This is one of my favorite quotes by Maya Angelou. It's also the basis for my philosophy of nursing. I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. We called my mom E, which was short for Evangeline or Eva. My mom was 71 years old, still worked full time, and went to the gym three times a week. She loved Zumba. February 2015, she started having soreness in her chest, her shoulders, and her back. And she said, I've just been working out too much, you know, too many push-ups. But at a routine exam, her doctor was concerned because her IgG and some other markers were elevated. He wanted her to go see a hematologist. In 1993, my mother had breast cancer. She underwent a double mastectomy and full sessions of chemo and radiation. She was a survivor. And now over 20 years later, she was being asked to see a hematologist, oncologist again. She had a PET scan and we sat down with Dr. X to discuss the results. Dr. X said, your mother has multiple myeloma, but if there was ever a cancer to have, this is the one, it's going to be great. I'm going to start her on a regimen of steroids and sub chemo. She won't even have to have infusions. And somehow, my nurse brain went out the window. And my daughter brain was so happy to hear that my mom had this great cancer. Great cancer, is there such a thing? And it was gonna be a walk in the park, his exact words. My mom started her sessions of steroids and chemo. And I would bring her milkshakes from Chick-fil-A because it was the only thing she wanted. But my mom became more weak and more tired. And then she got shingles. 
she would scream out in pain and said it felt like she was being electrocuted or struck by lightning. Dr. X prescribed oxycodone and gabapentin. My dad said my mom was still screaming out in pain and when I went to check on her, I saw the prescription was written wrong. Because I knew that gabapentin should be administered three times a day and hers was written for once daily. I called Dr. X's office, they apologized and said they would fix it. Her chemo was on hold until her shingles were solved. May 7th, 2015, I wanted to take my mom and dad out to dinner. My mom said she was tired, but I insisted. I thought it would be really good for her to get out of the house. At dinner, I noticed my mom couldn't breathe. She couldn't even finish a sentence without taking pauses to breathe. I begged her to go to the emergency room, get a chest x-ray, I thought she had pneumonia. She said that she had an appointment with Dr. X the next day, he would handle it. Dr. X didn't see my mom the next day, but they did draw labs. Her H&H &H was low, so they sent her for a blood transfusion. My friend happened to work at the transfusion center. She called me and she said, Cindy, I'm sending your mother to the emergency room because I don't like the way she's breathing. On May 8th, 2015, my mother walked, she walked on her own two feet and legs into the hospital. When I arrived to the ER, she was being transfused with half red blood cells and IV fluids at the same time. I politely asked the nurse, can you stop the IV fluids and wait for the blood to be done? She was admitted to 2 p.m. at first floor with a diagnosis of pneumonia. That night, I worked in the same hospital on a different unit, and I went to check on her around 2 a.m. I walk in to find a young nurse with a horrified look on her face, trying to get in touch with the doctor, a non-rebreather partly on her face, and she's breathing like this. I ran up to the third floor, I grabbed the intensivist by the arm, and I said, you will come see my mom right now. She was fluid overloaded, chest x-ray completely white. They started her on BiPAP, and they transferred her to special care, the IMC. While on special care, my mom's spirits were really good. Every doctor or person who came in said, wow, Mrs. Marcus, you look way better in person than you do on this computer. But something was wrong. The antibiotics, the antiviral, the antifungals, nothing was working. Her chest x-ray was worse every single day. Something was eating their lungs. So they wanted to do a bronchoscopy to try to see what was wrong. <clears throat> After the bronch, she was transferred to the ICU, room 3301, for monitoring because they struggled to get her off the bed. Instantly, my mom hated this room. She wanted to go back to special care, and I said, it's okay, mom. You'll only be here for a couple of hours. I watched my mom deteriorate into almost nothing. One nurse said, your mom moved her arm today. Moved her arm what? She walked into the hospital. He don't know her. Every morning at 5 a.m. they did a chest x-ray and when I would get off at 7.30, she was so upset because nobody would put her cover back on and she was too weak to put the cover back on. Every time I went in the room, I had to put her glasses on. She can't see without her glasses. She was NPO and they weren't giving her like any nutrition. I could see all of her rib cages now. But every time a doctor came in that room, he smiled and he said, your mom's doing great. And again, my nurse brain disappeared. And my daughter brain was looking for any sign of hope. When looking back, even if my mom had survived whatever was eating her lungs, she still had multiple myeloma the great cancer. On May 28th, 20 days after my mother walked into the hospital, I got off from my shift. I still had my nurse brain on. I walked into my mother's room and I said, she's fine. Because I knew what somebody looked like when we were dying. So I called my sister in North Carolina and I said, if you want to see mommy alive again, I suggest you get on a plane now. I told the intensivist, 
Tell me the truth. I'm not stupid. She's dying. He said, I'm going to take hostage to come talk to you. But I want to intubate her one more time for a third time. And my mother said, no. She hadn't spoken for days. She looked at me and she pleaded, home. I did everything I could to get my mother out of that room, but they said she wasn't stable enough to survive the transfer. On May 30th, at 5.33 a.m., my mother died in room 3301, the room that she hated, the room that I promised her she wouldn't die in. I have learned that people will forget what you said. I remember literally what was said during this entire time. People will forget what you did. I am positive that somebody did something nice for my mom, my dad, me, or my sisters, but I don't recall anything specific. But people will remember how you made them feel. What do I remember? I remember my mom being tossed around like a rag doll. I remember her being cold because they never recovered her. I remember that she couldn't see because she never had her glasses on. I remember every interaction that felt impersonal and I remember feeling ignored. Whose team are you on? What memories do you want your patients and your family members to have? How do you hope to make them feel?